All right, great. Well, welcome back, folks. Uh, people are definitely still going to keep trickling in, but we need to go ahead and get started. Um, I actually didn't introduce myself yesterday. I looked at the recording and realized I didn't introduce myself. I'm sure a lot of people already know who I am, but I'm Patrick Schultz. I'm an extension forester with Washington State University in Southwest Washington. I'm coordinating this lunch break series with much help from people like Gary and Ken. And then tomorrow we'll have Brent, um, some really great people from the Washington Department of Natural Resources and their service forestry program and the SFLO office, which hopefully we can plug in some links to the chat so you can explore their resources a little bit later. Um, but today we're here to talk about birds of prey with Gary. Um, and before I turn it over to him, just going to go through the usual logistics here. Uh, please make sure you set your chat box to the uh, everyone setting so that everyone can see your questions. Uh, that also makes it so that they're recorded in the chat transcript later for folks that are viewing the recordings. Speaking of, this will be recorded, of course, and I'm going to post those links on the uh, event homepage, which I sent out in the email earlier. And uh, actually, the session from yesterday is already up, so I'm going to do my best to get them up within a day, but they should all be uploaded for sure by uh, early next week. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Gary. You want to introduce yourself? All right, sure will. Thanks, Patrick. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for having me. Um, my name is Gary Bell, and I'm the uh, Forest Resilience District Manager for uh, DNR's Olympic Region and helping build out our new service forestry program across Western Washington to complement what's already been occurring on the east side. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I spent 22 years at WDFW um, as a basically primarily a wildlife biologist um, dealing with forest associated species, um, including you know, spotted owl uh, habitat, mirrorlet habitat, uh, other uh, threatened and endangered species, uh, either at the federal or state level, um, and a host of other species that are a uh, uh, priority species or habitats for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So uh, a wealth of experience in um, dealing with uh, conservation opportunities and, and management uh, in the forested realm and how that may affect uh, a lot of the different species that you guys see out there in your landscapes uh, and the landowner community. So <clears throat> as Patrick mentioned, uh, here to talk about the Washington Birds of Prey. Um, didn't not not an exhaustive list by any means, but just wanted to pick a few of the those that are pretty common that most of you are probably aware of um, in and around your your ownership. So with that, we can go ahead and get going on the presentation. Perfect. Uh, and I'll I'll give you a five minute warning if you want, Gary. Um, Sounds good. At twelve twenty five, and then uh, yeah, just like yesterday, uh, we'll we'll go through all the questions at the end. So people right. feel free to type away your questions in the chat. Uh, throughout the entire uh, presentation. All right, I'll stop my video. And start my show. Let's see here. All right, Patrick. <laughs> not seeing it yet. It's not showing up here. Just a uh -oh. second. Hold it, please. Technical difficulties. Um, let's see. This. Nope, that's not working either. It says it's going on my end. It that's, says you're sharing your screen? Um, it should be. Join test bar. It's. It is. Hold on here. Sorry about this. Oh. Um. Sean on the chat says that we, they can see your screen. That's interesting, but I I can't. Oh, okay. <laughs> can everybody right. see? Is are people seeing Gary's PowerPoint? Can you put in the? No. Okay. So no one. No. Okay. okay. No. So what happens when you hit the green button, Gary? It's not giving me the green button as an option for some reason on my displays here. You maybe hit more, the little three dots on the side and- Here we go. Okay. Try this again. There we go. 
Yay. Um, Victory. All right, cool. <laughs> Hopefully everybody can see that now. <laughs> we are still seeing, we're, it's not in presentation mode yet. So if you hit the from beginning piece there, button in the top left. Oops. Okay, and then you're gonna have to do the display settings again. I'm not sure why it does this. I'm not sure why it does that either. All right. Boy, are we there There yet? we go. All right, now we're cooking. All right, now we're cooking. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. So again, uh, my name is Gary Bell. I'm with the Department of Natural Resources um, for, well, April of last year. So it's creeping up on a year already. I can't believe it. But, um, I just wanted to give you guys some uh, information on several common uh, Washington birds of prey today. So um, just, uh, I, I, I didn't uh, go through an extensive laundry list of every bird out there that we would see on our, our Washington landscape, but just picked out some of the more common ones that uh, include some east side and west side stuff uh, that you all probably have seen and, and ran across in your ventures around too. So I uh, wanted to share a little <clears throat> red-tailed hawk uh, screenshot there from one of our long-legged buddies. Um, <laughs> and um, I'll go ahead and jump into um, a little bit about uh, what makes birds of prey unique here in Washington um, and, and, and elsewhere, but just uh, adaptations for, for birds of prey that allow them to uh, survive and thrive as species. So um, adaptation is defined as a, how a species may change over time to become better suited to its environment. And those adaptations can include things like a sharp curved beak for ripping and tearing them uh, apart prey. Um, and specialized digestive systems for processing bones, feathers, fur, organs, muscles, and all the other goodies that they take in. And forward-facing eyes for uh, locating prey, as well as uh, sharp talons and very strong feet uh, for catching and clutching prey items. So, and long broad wings for soaring while they're searching for prey. I'm sure you've all seen them up there in the sky many occasions. So I'm gonna jump into uh, the first species that I had listed there on that previous screen, uh, which is bald eagles. Um, as most of you know, they're a big bird. Um, they can have up to an eight foot wingspan and they have um, a pretty long lived uh, lifespan from, uh, that can be you know, up to 30 years in the wild and even a little bit longer, um, some of them in captivity. Um, they build amazing nests. I'm sure we've all, most of us have seen a nest somewhere along our travels that uh, they're huge. They're, they're wide and, and they can actually be pretty deep too, like up to 20 feet deep in some instances where there's been a, a persistent nest site that they'll come back to uh, each year. And kind of a, a little known fact, uh, they're actually pretty excellent swimmers. They can, they can uh, grab onto a fish and actually use their wings, just basically do the breaststroke and, and uh, swim to shore with a, a fish uh, in their talons. It's pretty cool. Um, and as uh, you know, they eat waterfowl and they eat fish, both live and carcasses uh, in the fall when the salmon runs are done. They're out there, you know, like on the Skagit Valley and, and, and places like that and pretty heavy concentrations feeding on the fish carcasses. But they'll also eat uh, turtles, snakes, frogs, muskrats, mice, smaller birds. Um, they'll um, chew on carrion that's left behind. And I don't know, folks on the east side have probably seen it uh, more than folks in Western Washington, but they'll also uh, concentrate around um, calving grounds during the calving season and feed on the, um, the placenta and the afterbirth from uh, when calves are born. Um, and <clears throat> they do mate for life. Um, unless their mate dies, of course, then they may take up a, a second mate. But in general, they're pretty monogamous. Um, and I'm sure most folks are pretty aware that they are a pretty amazing uh, conservation triumph. Um, back in the 60s, the number of breeding pairs um, was estimated down around 487 breeding pairs. And, and um, with changes to the laws surrounding pesticide use and the removal of DDT, um, 
they've made an, an amazing rebound uh, to roughly you know, a little over 71,000 breeding pairs by uh, last year. And here in Washington, we're you know estimating around 900 active breeding pairs uh, as of last year. So they have made an amazing comeback in a, in a relatively short amount of time. If you look at those numbers, that's a pretty impressive gain over the course of roughly 25 <laughs> or uh, 45 years. Um, so it's pretty cool to see. So we'll move on to the next species here, which is uh, the golden eagle. Um, not as common on the west side, primarily an east side critter, but um, they also are a very big critter <laughs> up to roughly a seven foot wingspan. Um, and they're also very long lived. They can live to you know, up to roughly 38 years or more. Um, and uh, they're actually pretty darn fast for as big a bird as they are. I uh, didn't realize it when I was doing my research here, but you know, some of the <clears throat> information indicated that they can get up to 200 miles an hour, which is pretty amazing for such a big animal. Um, and they're excellent hunters. Um, you know, uh, primarily hunt shrub step and open field habitat types, um, but they do rely on uh, forest habitat and uh, areas where they can uh, either build a nest like on a cliff or a ledge or um, in some of that you know, more secure forested environment. So uh, you know, small forests can be really important for them as well. Um, most of what they eat uh, you know, includes mid-sized mammals like hares, rabbits, ground squirrels, prairie dogs, mice, voles, snakes, lizards, um, smaller birds. Um, and, and they'll also like bald eagles, they'll, they'll um, uh, feed on carry on uh, dead carcasses and such. Um, and like bald eagles, they mate for life um, generally. And I know uh, WDFW did some um, fairly extensive uh, updates to their uh, known distribution for goldens in here in Washington a few years back. And, and so now the current estimate is roughly 60 breeding pairs here in the state. So uh, they're a, uh, kind of a, a slower um, reproducing species compared to, to bald eagles. So it, it takes a little bit longer. And, and with that uh, more extensive lifespan overall, um, you know, long, longer, longer to reproduce and, and they hold a lot longer. So as a result, there's fewer numbers on the landscape overall. So, and from that, we can go ahead and move on to red-tailed hawks. Um, I'm sure most everybody has seen them perched on a light pole or a street sign or something along the highway <laughs> in your travels. Uh, they're, they're pretty common here in, in, you know, across the state. Um, and they are uh, built to glide pretty well. They've got about a four foot wingspan at, at full uh, growth. And I'm assuming everybody has heard their nice shrieky screech call that lasts about two to three seconds when they're up there soaring around. Uh, it's funny because a lot of uh, the media industry will use the uh, red-tailed hawk call when they're picturing bald eagles. So it's a uh, Kind of out of place, but it's it's become one of those things that they just do, and everybody associates associates that call with the wrong bird. So anyway, um, and they'll eat uh, <clears throat> voles, rats, rabbits, um, ground squirrels, birds. Um, you know, up to the size of roughly a pheasant, um, and you know, various reptiles and snakes. I've personally seen tons of times where they're down there in the median on the highway with a snake in their grasp. So they're pretty uh, amazing hunters, um, either perch, perched from a, a sitting position or if they're even you know, soaring or just kind of cruising through the median, uh, the freeways and alongside the, the roads like over in Eastern Washington and a lot of that agricultural country, you'll see them out there sit perched on a post waiting for something to move. Uh, they have amazing eyesight, it's about eight times stronger than humans. And, they are actually um, expert co-parents. They, they take turns incubating the egg and, and, and feeding the young uh, once the, the eggs hatch out. So they have a pretty cooperative process when it comes to bringing up the young. Um, they're just, in general, I think they're just a beautiful bird. And, and, and again, I, I see them 
quite often in, in my area of the state. So it's pretty neat. So another uh, species that is associated more with forest habitats that you know small forest landowners and, and others may have uh, on their property that would support uh, is called a northern goshawk. So go ahead and, and talk about them next. And they're the largest hawk species. They have a wingspan that can go up to 40 inches, which is pretty sizable considering they're more of a, a forest and, and forest canopy associated bird. And the ability to, to maneuver within those, those timber stands this is pretty amazing if you've ever seen one. Um, and some folks in the, in the forestry world are probably very aware that these can be very territorial birds and, and they can actually swoop down and attack you like a, a barred owl would um, in a local setting. So but, uh, they have uh, a lot of uh, maneuvering capability um, despite that potentially large size. It's pretty neat. A um, little shorter lifespan compared to the eagles. They're you know, roughly 10 to 11, 12 years. So that's a pretty old goshawk out there in the landscape. Um, and, and they do nest in um, primarily in like second growth conifer. Um, they need enough canopy openness to be able to move within that area. Um, and and they'll, they'll also uh, nest in deciduous forest stands as well. Uh, primarily, most of my observations over the years have been that those nest sites are located within uh, conifer stands. Um, and they are carnivores. They eat as small to medium-sized mammals and medium to large-sized birds um, you know, found along uh, forests, uh, within the forest stand, along edges, and where there's a change in the, the age of the timber type um, and, and out into those adjacent kind of scrub land habitat types. Um, they'll also take you know, reptiles and amphibians and, and fish and insects uh, just pretty opportunistic and, and go ahead and grab onto you know whatever's available as a food resource and uh, similar to eagles they do have the tendency to mate for life so another monogamous bird out there so <clears throat> go ahead and move on to another one that most folks have probably seen up there gliding around on the wind and that's the turkey vulture and turkey vultures are a pretty big bird, um, as you know, if you've seen them, 65 to 70 foot wingspan. Um, they're a little ugly. If you look at their lovely little red head, they have a, a unique uh, <laughs> appearance there. But uh, they are very unique in that they actually have a, a keen sense of smell. Most birds don't have a sense of smell. So it's pretty interesting that, that these guys can smell uh, dead stuff a mile away, basically. <laughs> and they primarily scavenger on, on the carry on, you know, either roadkill or, you know, naturally, uh, natural mortality kills out in the, in the environment. And interesting, cool, fun fact is that they actually have a unique self-defense mechanism where they can vomit on something that's approaching them or towards something approaching them up to 10 feet which is impressive for a bird. <laughs> I don't think I can vomit 10 feet. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's, it's really interesting uh, little defense mechanism they have and, and adds to a little bit more to their uniqueness. But uh, you know, they, they're common to most uh, you know, suburban and rural areas. And you'll see them up there floating on the breeze as the, the, the day warms up and you get more uh, thermal activity. You'll see them up there flying around, cruising around, looking for a, a meal. Um, we've got some, quite a few, um, I'm not sure what the number is here in Western Washington, but it seemed to be a fair number of, of vulture roosts around. I see them pretty, pretty uh, regularly when I'm out doing my work. Well, and we'll go ahead and move on to another bird that most folks probably are familiar with here in Washington, and that is the osprey. And <clears throat> most osprey live near water of some sort, and typically their tree, their nests are on the, the top of bro broken out trees, or um, you know you see them on telephone poles. There's a lot of platforms that you know we, uh, humans have built for them. You know, both east and west side, they've actually they'll build a, 
nest in a cell tower, um, anything that's uh, up high like that, um, where they have that that uh, vantage point. Um, and fairly long lived, kind of middle of the road, uh, 15 to 20 years, uh, the typical lifespan for, for osprey. And they are primarily fish eaters, um, which is pretty um, obvious once, once you get that <clears throat> sense of how they associate and then where they, they live close to, to water bodies pretty much um, consistently. And I didn't know this, but they can actually migrate over the course of a lifetime a pretty significant distance up to 160,000 miles uh, have been documented in uh, Osprey's lifetime migrating back and forth. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, it's a lot of traveling. So something unique that's uh, really cool that I didn't know as well when I was doing my research on these guys is that they have what's called a facultative zygodactyly which means the ability to rotate one of their three front toes backwards to grip slippery fish more securely when they go down and swoop and, and grab them out of the water. So I thought that was a pretty cool little factoid for them. And as you see in the bottom picture here, um, they consistently carry fish forward facing like that so that there's less drag when they're uh, taking those prey items back to the nest or wherever they go to perch to, to uh, go ahead and eat them up. So I thought that was pretty cool. And like uh, most of these other birds, they typically will mate for life. Uh, a lot of monogamous bird relationships out there. So a little talk, wanted to touch a little bit on kind of how, how do we, as landowners, you know, small, small forest landowners and large, how do we support birds of prey um, and some of the uh, examples here you know it's like keep big nest trees for for uh, them to nest in on the landscape and, and provide edges for hunting and foraging like this picture on the right where you've got multiple stand ages and and even some clear-cut edge habitat where uh, for example a, you know red tail or a, a goshawk you come out and feed along that edge um, and maintaining snags for perching and foraging. And uh, as you see in the background, that there's a picture of a, a wind damage stand that actually created a bunch of beautiful snags in that localized landscape. Doesn't look good from a silvicultural perspective, but in terms of habitat, that is gonna be an awesome stand for a long time for a lot of uh, these uh, birds and, and the, the critters that, that support them. Um, and as well as you know, snags, you can get cavities for, for nesters and, and, and that, yeah, nesting for cavity birds and that kind of thing as well. Um, and again, if you've got the right snag in the right area, it can support actually a nesting platform, like for example, for Northern Spotted Owl, because they don't build their own nests. They use, take advantage of those uh, unique features within those, those snags to, to develop a nest site. And then overall, you know, it's uh, promoting habitat diversity in, in your landscape and, you know, at whatever scale that may be is always beneficial for all of these birds at some point or another. So don't be afraid to uh, develop a, a, an array of, of different habitat types and stands, um, you know, if you've got ownership and, and the room to do so. so uh, there's some th things to think about uh, when you're managing uh, your small forest lands out there. So, and with that, I think I'll wrap it up and take any questions that you guys may have. Perfect. Thanks, Gary. Um, it's good that you wrapped up on time because we have a ton of questions in the chat box. So <laughs> strap in. Um, okay. I know I'm, and some people may have to take off at 1230. Just a reminder, I am recording all this and you can... Um, catch whatever you missed afterwards but uh, great presentation Gary really like that I like that you touched on the difference between uh or or the fact that in movies they're playing a red hawks uh red tail hawks call not the <laughs> yeah. ball eagle because I'm the annoying guy that points that out every time too <laughs> and if too. you ever <laughs> yeah if you ever listen to an eagle call it's really not that majestic it sounds kind of like a seagull I think yeah yeah um, all right so 
let's see. I'm going to scroll back to the top here. Um, and please feel free to, to continue to ask questions as we work through these. But I'll feed them to you, Gary. Uh, and the first question is actually from Ken. Uh, back to your number, I think, on the bald eagle mating pairs. Uh, was the number 487 referring to the whole country or just Washington? Oh, yeah, I forgot to, to mention that. Those numbers um, are national numbers um, mm. for that 487 pairs back in 63. And then the, the 71 plus um, as of 21 or 22, those were numbers that uh, are national at the national scale. And that the bottom number is that roughly 900 breeding pairs here in Washington. Wow. Um, and then we got a question about eagle swimming, which Ken kind of answered in the chat looks like, but how do eagles swim? Uh, as I had mentioned, they pretty much do the breaststroke you know, with whatever they're holding on to. Or, and I've actually seen, uh, witness on my own, uh, one uh, uh, injured eagle that was, I don't know what happened, but it was injured you know, out over the water and actually landed in the water. And I watched it struggle and swim to shore, uh, basically just doing the breaststroke, you know, bringing their wings over the top each time and just you know, keep paddling towards shore. And it actually made it to shore. And, and, was able to get onto the shoreline and stuff. But yeah, it's it's pretty cool to watch. If you that yeah, that's interesting because I saw a video somewhere online recently of some people trying to rescue a bald eagle that was it looked like it was waterlogged basically. In the, but but I think maybe they just didn't know that it was swimming. They could have gave it some more time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and they will, of course, tire out too. You know, it's sure. like any of us. You can only do the breaststroke for so long before your wings. Get... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Laurel asked, uh, and I think this is in reference to the Golden Eagle. Uh, was the two hundred miles per hour is that flying or in a dive? In a dive. In a dive. Yeah. Okay. Mention that. And I think we got uh, quite a few questions about golden eagle populations um and bob kind of sums them up uh why is the golden eagle so rare in washington and what limits its population growth so in terms of rarity i mean a lot of it's driven by habitat availability and the appropriate habitat type here in washington um you know like i said most most of the eagles the golden eagles are on the east side where you have more um shrub step and, and ag and, and open uh, habitat areas for their foraging um, and, and their prey base. So that's, um, in general, that's, you can kind of compare, you know, west side, you've got more dense conifer forest types versus that east side where you've got dry ponderosa pine, you know, dominant stand types with more open uh, adjacent habitats that, that provide more of a prey base, thus the, yeah. you know, the variance in, in the distribution and in terms of that population growth uh, again I think it's driven mostly by their longevity they do have that tendency tendency to live a little longer and, and maintain that you know breeding pair uh, for a longer duration on the landscape and they're not pre producing as many eaglets on an annual cycle as, as bald eagles may be so I think that in terms of growth I, I don't know that's uh, a matter of growth. I think it's more of a matter of sustaining um, the numbers based on what available habitats out there on the landscape, kind of that carrying capacity concept. Gary, can I can I add something, Gary? Yeah. That goldens are highly migratory too, and their habitat needs in that more yeah. open country, an awful lot of it has been converted to human use that they don't really do well with. And um, lead poisoning has been an issue. Yeah. And uh, and there's been data in California in particular that wind turbines have been really hard on goldens. And um, so uh, I'm going to just take the next one there. Will wind turbines be changed somehow to help birds out? That's a huge question, Lisa, that you could dive into wind industry and mitigations and everything that uh, there, re there really is no answer to that right now. I used to work in wind power a little bit. T take them down and, and put the solar panels out there instead they're much less than obtrusive <laughs> except the solar panels will take away turtle habitat or well, that's right. true. there's just no balance <laughs> yes, yeah, tough questions 
Yeah, so I mean, uh, Google up a Golden Eagle continent-wide patterns, and they're not in the forested habitats of Western Washington. People often think that a juvenile bald is a golden, but they're not, they're different. Anyway, golden, yeah, cool. I, Thank, thanks for including them, Gary. Yeah, I've only seen one golden on the west side in, in all my movement around. It was actually out up toward the coast. But, yeah, and it was pretty close great. to where there was some more open ag area you know, and, and the appropriate habitat for foraging opportunity primarily. All right. Um, Marion asked, uh, can you talk some more about the digestion of feathers? She says she's a, a town dweller and hasn't had opportunities to watch raptor eat its kill, but one time saw uh, a Cooper's uh, kill a quail in the yard and watched it spend basically a lot of time defeathering uh, the bird before eating it. So it's just kind of curious uh, if you can speak a little more to, to feather digestion and how often I guess that happens. Yeah, I mean, I think that the overall trend, you know, there is that they can't digest feathers as well, you know, especially the quill um, you know, with that harder, you know, calcified substance, basically. So a lot of times they will spend a lot more time plucking to get to, you know, the goodies on the inside, on those soft, chewy parts that are easier to digest. Mm -hmm. So I got a question from Hollis Crapo, a fellow DNR. Uh, regulation assistance forester. He asked, how is eyesight eight times that of humans? Is it clarity at a distance? Um, and he says, I never understood how eagle eyes work because it's frequently portrayed as seeing things far away as closer. So any thoughts on that? It's more that uh, the acuity and, and the ability to see things further away. So it's kind of like that eight times magnification, like you were looking through a lens, right? Mm. <clears throat> okay. So it sounds like that's accurate. Yeah. 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 It is. Thanks, Hollis. Uh, so Rhonda asked if there is research regarding lead poisoning from gut piles. And Ken, I think you answered this somewhere in the chat. That's yeah, I, re I read some cool stuff from Minnesota where they had done these studies where they actually fired bullets into sheep carcasses and then x-rayed them. And what they found out was that bullets, even though a lot of times they'll come through whole, they'll shatter and there's little lead particles, you know, through the, the entrails. And then when you gut the animal out and throw it on the ground, and it doesn't take much lead for some birds to poison them. And the condors have suffered from that. Probably one of the limiting factors on California condors recovery has been over the years, lead poisoning. So I'm yeah. going to use- Yeah, and the same for, for swans. You know, that's still a continuing go. problem up there in the Skagit Valley. So if, you're a, if, if you're a hunter and you want to do something for conservation, switch to copper. It works. I'm a hunter and I shoot <laughs> copper and it works. Nice. Oh, that's a good tip. Um, we got a good question here that, I, so that I've kind of been curious about too. Um, by mate for life, does this mean meeting up at the nest site each year or do they also uh, travel and migrate together? That's a good question. From my I understanding, it's you. more of that latter. I think it's more they do kind of travel and, and stay you know, closely associated as they do migrate if, they, if they're migrating. Um, yeah. And I can't say that for certain that happens in every case, but I think overall, I think that's probably the generality is that they do maintain contact with that mate and move around that landscape together. It's interesting. Yeah. And I, I was kind of blown away by how many of the birds you mentioned were uh, monogamous, as you said. It's surprising when you start looking at some of the, the information there, it's like, wow, <laughs> you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Betsy asked, will goshawks be found in small timber stands uh, near development in suburban uh, rural areas? I can give you a confident maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I have actually observed a goshawk um, very close to a um, kind of a suburban landscape, just in a timber stand up on a hillside, not that far off of 101. So okay it, it's you know, uh, you know the primary driver is you got to have food and you got to have shelter just like the rest of us right so if you've got the appropriate food and the appropriate shelter and the appropriate cover you're probably going to be able to eke out a living it might not be the prime habitat that you know we associate with that particular bird but 
um, again, in this instance, yeah, I could say yes, I've seen it. <laughs> but in general, they usually are a little more reclusive uh, mm. and, and prefer a larger, they have a fairly large kind of, they call it a post uh, uh, family area where they'll, they'll use a, two or three or four nest sites within an overall larger stand on a landscape scale and, and filter throughout that area over the course of time. Right, so Emily might have us on a technicality here. Uh, do turkey vultures hunt at all or only scavenge? Does that fit the definition of a bird of prey? Stick later for the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Amazingly enough, yes, they actually will um, hunt. At, oh, okay. at <laughs> it's not often. <laughs> so touche, good to point out, but they, <laughs> they are primarily a scavenger, but they do also uh, hunt uh, at certain times, depending on what their needs are. Uh, okay. It's not very often. They do. <laughs> and I'd like to chime in on something too. They are not ugly. They're uniquely beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> My wife really likes turkey vultures, even though I think well, they're I ugly. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. They're go They're goofy and they're kind of cool. Yeah. yeah, they're fun to watch. I've got a, a site up on the uh, Olympic Peninsula where we're doing some Taylor's Checker Spot Butterfly annual surveys. And there's definitely a, a vulture roost up there because I see them gliding around every time I'm up there doing a survey. <laughs> up, up pretty close too, so it's cool to see them up close like that. Uh, we'll follow up on the vulture question. Uh, Lisa asked if they migrate. They do. Any sense of where they go? <laughs> South. South? <laughs> sure. All right. South, other appropriate habitats um you know primarily yeah. i assume it's driven you know by weather conditions <laughs> how far they might actually try to push out of an area and, but we do have a lot of native you know kind of in, indigenous populations if you will um here where you have roosts that you know we uh, have been documented and, and we know that they just live on that particular hillside kind of thing not not in eastern Washington. They they skedaddle about mid September. They're gone, gone, gone. They'll come back in end of April. Interesting. Um, sorry, I just lost my place in the chat here. It's uh, and it's growing too all the time. Um, so M asks, what is the maximum expected weight bald eagles can Ooh. fly with in their clutches? Oh, that's a good one. I don't recall offhand a specific number there. But, um, you know, they're they're big, they're strong, so they can definitely carry uh, more than most of the other bird species. Uh, I would guess, you know, probably up to 25, 30 percent of their body weight. Yeah, Gary, I, I read something one time that said that birds of prey often can carry about one and a half times their body weight is just a kind of a I don't know, guideline. Okay. I, mean, I, so I wonder if you, you're looking if you've at heard a, that. Uh, quite a bit more than what I just stated then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, okay. I mean, that was probably like a genius factoid, but I always kind of, that kind of stuck in my head. Yeah. So what does a bald eagle weigh? Did you say, I think you did say like five pounds? Um, I don't think I actually put that little factoid down on paper. I'd have to, I'd have to look, honestly. <laughs> I know that was something that struck me with the owls is they're really light, you know, like a, yeah. a great, great horn is like two pounds. Yeah. Anyway, I want to say, you know, roughly like a, a full grown mature eagle, just having held one in my own grasp and <laughs> carried it to a dog cage to take it to pause. <laughs> um, probably that one was probably about 17 or 18 pounds. Really? Yeah, pretty, wow. pretty. They're much more dense. Yeah, you know, just yeah, a lot <laughs> oh, okay. Muscle. A lot more muscle there. All muscle, yeah. Yeah. That, wow, cool. So Anne asked a very specific question, and and maybe she has something she's uh, working off of here. But she asked, "Do turkey vultures have bacteria on their face that cause cancer?" And maybe there's some interesting I, factoid that yeah, you've heard of. That may be out there somewhere, but you know they do possess bacteria within their saliva, mm -hmm. and they will actually throw up on even on their uh, feet to clear the bacteria. Oh, all of the invasive. Yeah. Bacteria. Oh, interesting. Was yeah. that the bird that could throw up? Like, yeah, that's say, like the vomiting feet? bird. <laughs> <laughs> can throw up 
10 feet away. <laughs> 10 feet, that's more reasonable. <laughs> now, that, now that's charming. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty birds. Uh, Marion asks, uh, and, and this is similar to the question about vultures, but where do ospreys uh, that live here in Washington migrate in the winter? And don't just say south. <laughs> I think they go far south as Mexico, if I recall mm. correctly, that will they'll migrate a significant distance into right. that's kind of the southern hemisphere area. But if you go to the Gulf of California, I understand. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. Um, Betsy asked, uh, well, she says, I know you needed to limit the number of birds you could talk about today, but how prevalent and important are Cooper's hawks and sharpshin in this area? I I think they're actually more prevalent than people realize. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not as familiar with either their um, you know, life cycles and, and based on information that I've come across and what I've researched, but I, I think they are certainly more prevalent than, than we give them credit for. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll, I'll chime in on, on that one a little bit. Sorry, I was gonna chime in on that one, that one a little bit that the Coopers are even more highly migratory, uh, you know, up and down the West Coast. Sharp shins also migrate, but some of them will find a place to winter. So usually like in uh, town settings where there's the little occipiter that's raiding your bird feeder, it's almost always a sharp shin. And yeah. the, coopers have, the coopers have passed through uh, in, the, in the fall well, and the spring. Um, yeah, and so they're, they're going to points north to nest in forested settings. Hmm. So the Coopers, so, the Sharp Shin, excuse me, the Sharp Shin, the Coopers and the Goshawk are all three basically variations of the same body form with the Goshawk being the biggest. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So we got a couple of questions about the recordings um, and where you can find them. So I, I sent you a link in the email uh, yesterday morning and this morning, and and in the body of that, there is a link to the basically event page where you registered for this. Um, and I'm just going to be uploading all the links there. So I'll, I'll be sending out that email each morning. It's always going to have that link. Um, so if you've lost that email, uh, I can get it to you again tomorrow. All right. Uh, <laughs> Steve asked kind of a, a personal question for you. Uh, Gary, why, why, why the move from WDFW to WDNR? <laughs> <laughs> we are getting personal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can answer that a little bit. Um, you know, I spent I said twenty two years at DFW, and and about the last fourteen of that was um, you know focusing primarily on uh, forest associated species, both avian and uh, you know mammals and, and such. Pretty much all of the non game species. So. Um, as things evolved within the work I was doing at DFW, I got um, much more heavily involved in conversations around forest resilience and forest health and, you know, better opportunities to um, provide long-term conservation measures um, for a lot of the species that we're dealing with. You know, they got to have a place to be, right? We're taking away habitat. They're losing um, opportunities for, for home. So, um, I spent you know, quite a bit of time uh, getting really heavily involved in, in forest resilience conversations in North Central Washington and, and participated with the collaborative and, and the Forest Service on some planning for a pretty big uh, uh, project going on in the Upper Wenatchee watershed. And, and that led to uh, more interest in, 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 in from me in, in looking at forest resilience and how we can um, conserve species um, by doing more to conserve habitat. And, and build resilience in the habitat in the face of climate change and, and all these other factors that come into play. So in general, that's kind of why I made the jump. Well, we're glad to have you. Thanks. I, I thought it was because we have dinner, a, but <laughs> I thought it was because we had a cooler logo, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> the cool new logo, yeah. So Susan <laughs> asked, uh, what state has the most bald eagle breeding pairs uh, being surprised that we only have 900? I'm going to guess Alaska. Am I right? I'm thinking so, yeah. yeah. I didn't uh, actually look up that specific. I know they can be considered kind of a pest up there. 
Yeah, I mean, I spent time in Dutch Harbor and it's kind of intimidating walking down the um, the pier because there's like, you know, 20 eagles on the perch of every building and they're staring at you like you're their next meal. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's a much uh, much worse version of Hitchcock's The Birds, if it's just all bald yes. eagles. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it is pretty amazing that I remember it. I mean, I'm old enough now to remember when seeing a bald eagle was rare and people would get excited. And it is an enormously significant conservation success story, thanks to good work and the ESA and all this stuff. I mean, that needs to be, I appreciate your pointing that out, Gary, because that needs to be brought out. That it is an absolute success story. We could have killed our national symbol easily if we hadn't have acted when we did. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you you kind of touched on this a little bit. Someone asked, "Can we support these magnificent birds with nesting material, food, etc.?" So you kind of touched on like the structures and habitat, but uh, food is an interesting. I think peace. Yeah, supplementing food for any wild species is never really a recommended practice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's more about building, uh, you know, maintaining the habitat and the structure and and the and the opportunities for them to forage and have that prey base available. Those are the the most important things you can do is ensuring that those the prey base is there for them. Right? They got to have food. Right. So that's so the there's, best thing. There, there's several comments back to the the windmill. Uh, the wind turbines, <laughs> sorry, the wind, wind turbines conversation about colored blades and some uh, research going into how that can actually mitigate uh, some of the damage done to mm -hmm. bird populations. So I think the, sounds like the research is, is still looking into that. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine that's kind of, you know, a continuing effort as more and more wind turbine farms pop up mm -hmm. on the landscape, just figuring out more of that kind of long-term monitoring and what are the true effects that we're having on these different species? Right. There, there was quite a wind rush a few years ago, and it's, yeah, okay. and, the, and the outcomes, that, that's a whole ball of wax, and I'm almost sorry I weighed in on that. Uh, Gary, part of my old PFW job was <laughs> looking at wind power, and it's, it's, yep. a, it's certainly a mixed bag, because some, some birds, no problem, other birds, yes, a problem, and sighting is everything. So anyway. Yeah, yep. Google Google up Hawkwatch and these these sites and look at the industry sites too because they they acknowledge that it has an effect and they are trying some things and so that's a work in progress. Well, we got a question for you, Ken. When are you going to write a song about a turkey vulture? <laughs> How about right now? I can smell the puke from far away. Yeah, there's a lot of good content in there. <laughs> yeah, that one's full of fodder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Gary's, Gary's going to help me. <laughs> All right. Our next um, oh, Steve asked, are turkey vultures easy to identify up in their sky, in the sky with their red heads? Uh, I said he doesn't get an opportunity to see them up close. I would say yes, because specifically for those turkey vultures, if you look at the end of their wings, you can kind of see fingers where there's those feathers are spread apart, just like your hand when you spread your fingers apart. And I would say, for me, that's just a really easy way to pick them up, uh, looking at looking up from the ground. It's pretty yeah. obvious. You and Lisa points, Lisa points out their dihedral. They have a, a V shape and they sort of wobble. They're like, whoa, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're pretty distinctive. Watch, watch turkey vulture and a red tail, and you'll be like, okay, got it. Go yeah, on. yeah. Turkey colt uh, vultures are the are the clumsy version of the. <laughs> yes, there's got to be one, one right? Tail, right? <laughs> a, a clumsy red tail. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this is the last question, but there is a lot of uh, a lot of comments and a lot of love, Gary, for your presentation <laughs> that you should uh, yeah. you should definitely dig in and read. Uh, but Jeffrey asked, and this is another interesting one that I'd never heard of. Is it true that propane companies add odor to the gas that would attract vultures so that the gas company can find pipe leaks? Have you heard of that before? Have not, but you know, anything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> There's always some crazy little experiment going on out there somewhere that we don't know about. That's interesting. Very interesting. I like it. All right. 
Well, oh, I guess we got one more from Joan. Uh, she said she saw a documentary that said that there are now problems with eagle resurgence in the Oregon coast causing issues with possibly marbled merlets or some other kind of bird. Is there an interaction there uh, that you've heard of? To my knowledge, there really isn't an interaction between bald eagles and, and their impacts on merlets. Um, Marillettes typically are going to be a little further at sea than you would see an eagle um, venturing. Mm. They're, they're certainly, you know, tied more to that coastal edge. You know, one one bird that bald eagles have impacted, maybe this is it, are um, great blue herons, and that there's oh, been definitely. Heron, there's yeah. been there's been heron rookeries that actually were abandoned because a local eagle started preying on the nest. Uh, yep. and. Yeah, and loons too. There's there's places where you eat bald eagles hmm. take loons. Yeah, I hadn't heard yeah, of that. I, I had a, 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 a <clears throat> great blue heron roost that I was trying to find and verify uh, a few years back uh, by uh, Purdy on the Key Peninsula, and it, that's exactly what happened. Ken, that the, the really? eagles had impact. They the the stand was open enough because it was in um, deciduous uh, cover, so. The oh. eagles could just come in there and pick off the young when they were sitting right in the nest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, so unforeseen outcome, you bring back an apex predator and there's effects. Yep. It's all tied together. There, is no, there, is, there is no balance of nature. It just responds. Exactly. Oh, wait, that, that's another talk. Sorry, Patrick. <laughs> all right well yeah that's a good point to stop we are through the chat and all the questions um thank you gary right. it was a great presentation yeah. really appreciate it yeah. um for those of you that are still on tomorrow we will be talking waterfowl uh with brett haverkamp who i think is on the chat right now actually hey brent uh, we'll see him tomorrow at noon and we'll see you there too and i'll uh go ahead and stop this and get that recording up as soon as possible all right cool all right thanks thanks for having me patrick it's fun thank you thanks gary yep all thanks right. ken talk Bye to you everybody. Soon.